Hello viewers and welcome to Spotlight here on Hope TV where you look and live. And here on Hope TV we always do our very best to bring to you commentaries that are helpful uh, for your reflection and also uh, helpful in your conversations and very importantly that we consider helpful for your Christian action. And on tonight's uh, edition of Spotlight, we'll look at two reflections. One is entitled The God of Eight Billion Languages that focuses on the uniqueness or the specificness with which God speaks to his people. And also, uh, very, very importantly for the times that we are living in now, we will be looking at the state of the church and the relationship between the church and the politicians, which is a case of contemporary concern. Let's start with the God of eight billion languages. Matthew 1 verse 23 says, And his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. Now, because God understands the uniqueness of all eight billion of us in the world, God gladly and fluently speaks eight billion languages to create and instruct life in its full abundance. Now, oftentimes we have heard people say, God has spoken or God has not spoken. In such instances, there is an implication that God will act audibly. The other phrase that is often used in Christian circles is God is moving or God has not moved. In the case of this expression, the general expectation is that God will act visibly. In responding to and interacting with us, God speaks and acts. But God's word is as good as his act, and his act is equivalent to his voice. When he speaks, he could speak instructively, to which our response would be obedience. He could also speak creatively, where he speaks things into being. Now, our response in this case would be stewardship. Now, when God acts, then we have the specific things that we desire him to do for us, in us, and through us. Some of these things are external, like getting a job, a, a healing, finding a marriage partner, finding a house to stay in, effecting a reconciliation, and such other outwardly notable things. Others are internal, such as attaining peace of mind, stopping a craving for, say, hamburgers, gaining self-love, and such other inner man things. But there is a prevalent notion amongst many a faithful that God's voice is predictable and homogeneous. With this kind of understanding, what we wait for then is our turn for the homogeneous voice to be directed to us. The image of this perception creates uh, is, is an image of, of people waiting outside an entrance of a big iron gate with a voice coming through, a voice that is mean, you know, from a horn speaker calling out names randomly and at unpredictable intervals. Truth is that God speaks one message in many shades and colors, the message of love to all creation. But it is not homogeneous in the literal sense of the word. The message of love is sweetened by the uniqueness of the particular location of an individual. The message could be the same, but the delivery is personalized. That is why our Lord's name is Emmanuel, God with us. God's personalization goes to the finest detail. God in his desire that we see him and hear him goes to the extent of considering such factors as nationality, tribe, native language, family background, hopes and ambitions, marital status, hobbies, areas of profession, dislikes, education, gender, fears, even such physical features as hate. Now, when God's voice comes to you, it is so personalized, you cannot pass it on to someone else. With this understanding then, the joy of hearing God is partly in hearing him after the wait, and partly also in hearing him in your language. 
God knows your geographical, intellectual, emotional, financial, and spiritual addresses. When you hear God in the language of your life location, there is a surprising joy that comes from the realization that God knows you by name. There is a joy in knowing that your creator does not speak to you en masse. There is a joy in knowing that your creator can pull you out of a crowd and whisper to your ears something that only you can understand. There is a sweet joy in knowing that God can pull a jig which only you can find entertaining. There are also many unique life situations in the world as there are thumbprints. God is familiar with all this because he patents the thumbprints in the first place. Because he understands the uniqueness of all 8 billion of us, he gladly and fluently speaks 8 billion languages to create and instruct life in its full abundance. So, as you await God's action and as you await God's voice, do not listen and look out only in the generals. Be even more attentive to the particulars of your persona and the rawness of your circumstance because that is where you hear God's voice for you. Now, to an issue that is of contemporary importance, an issue that is really, really critical, that has become a discussion in many forums, and that is the priest politician relationship. Priest politician relationship. Now, one continuing critique on the church is the way it bows down to politicians. The church is seemingly unable to say no to the politicians. Politicians in turn have carved out their place and the church is unable so far to tame them. The routine is known. Invite them for a fundraiser. Fundraisers mostly for sanctuaries and such brick and mortar projects. And in turn, the politicians get their chance not to sing in the choir, but to say what they wanted to say. The political things, the political statements they want to make. After speaking, after the politicians say that which it is they want to say, the priest prays for them, prays over them, even sometimes anoints them for leadership. Now, we can clearly say the politicians have bought a piece of the altar with money. Because of a desperation for money, churches are accused of intentionally seeking money whose sources are suspicious and then sanitize the money with the offertory prayer. Through its appetite for money, the church has exposed itself as desperate. Now, we had hoped that the COVID season would be a time for the church to think deeply about its mission, its role in the society, and take its time to rebrand. As we near the election year, one critical area of rebranding was and is the church's relationship with politicians. This need to rebrand you know, is further necessitated by the missing COVID billions and possible money eaters of COVID. The church has had enough time to repent, re-envision, renew, and reposition itself. But if observation is anything to go by in the last few weeks, the last few weeks in which the church has been reopened, it seems people have expectations of the church that the church does not have of itself. Even the public is concerned. What happened to the church as a voice for the people? Clearly, we have a church that is determined 
to remain the same. Now, biblically, the church is supposed to help kings interpret dreams and give to the king the meaning of seasons. It seems like as far as the church and its relationship with politicians is concerned, COVID was meaningless. But was COVID meaningless? Was it just another pointless, meaningless occurrence? I think not. We either have a church that is theologically dislocated and therefore facing an identity crisis, or we have a church that sees and hears God speak but is outrightly defiant, or we have an institution that uses the word church but is really something else, or we have a church that is so deep into the woods that it needs a thorough shake up to wake up from its slumber and come to its senses. Politicians are back in the church and the church is back to the politicians. If the priest is still impressed by the politician, if the politician is not trembling before God's altar, then COVID has taught us nothing at all. I have an impression that even the politicians were surprised to go back to the church and find the same old tune, maybe even a little off tune. It is not that the politician is not welcome to church. It is not that the church does not honor the status of the politician. The politician is welcome in the church. Political leaders will be respected in the church as well. The thing is that as they come to the church, they need to be told that the church is a dedicated space. It is therefore not neutral. Because it is not neutral, there are some things that cannot and should not be spoken in it. The church is a place set apart for the experience of the presence of God. And it must be respected as such. When people dishonor the place dedicated to God, the presence of God has wills. It will depart. Now, in the sanctuary, the priest is in charge. The mass is not an administrative meeting where the priest sits to listen to the civic leaders. No, the church is a place of mediation, mediating between people and God. The priest is in charge here. Now, being in charge does not mean a show of power. It means the deep conviction of pointing people to the cross. But sometimes, pastors are too mesmerized by present politicians that they shift from mediating to impressing. Make the politician comfortable when they visit your home. But in the sanctuary, the task is to point them to the uncomfortable cross. In the sanctuary, every ambition is valid. The church is a gathering of people who especially bring burdens before God. Some have ambitions to reopen a business they had closed. Others are seeking capital and courage to start a new career and business paths. Others are praying to build up school fees for their children. Others are praying to get out of debt. Others praying a stubborn spouse to have an attitude, of trans, an attitude transplant. Others come hoping God's help will bring their prodigal children back home to their senses. All these requests are equally heavy and they are all valid. So if anyone is to kneel down to be prayed for by the priest, it should be everyone in the sanctuary. It should not be that those with political ambitions are accorded special prayers. Every prayer is as weighty 
as the other. In the sanctuary, the transaction is not money, but mercy. The politician who brings money today will come again and remind you about the gift you received and why you must now convert it into a vote. The priest must be aware of this transaction. Rise above it to focus on the transaction of mercy. But when the church leadership is left singing about the visitation by a man, they will lose their eye for the visitation of God. And the political leader should know. Do not be under pressure to carry a donation to a church. This is for the political leader. Do not be under pressure to carry a donation to a church. Just come in and worship. Experience the mercy transaction. Now, the sanctuary is not part of the campaign circuit. The trend is that when political leaders have a rally in the afternoon, they visit a local church in the morning, and they expect to collect some mileage from the attendance in the church. The church is therefore not an end as we may hope to the politician. It is a means, a stop on the road before the big rally. Now, the priest shouldn't stop the reduction of the church to a mere political pit stop. The church must be respected. A visiting politician may be recognized, but must not be given a chance to talk. It is not compulsory. The sanctuary is not a platform for publicity. It's not a platform for political publicity. I don't know, have you ever wondered why in the news, in the reporting, when a politician is in a church, they almost always show the politician speaking, but never the pastor preaching? Because the pastor is not newsworthy. The politician is self-publicized, is self-publicizing in the name of worship. And this is undermining the gathering of God's people. Let the politician know that we do not use God, rather we are used by him. In the sanctuary, content is key. The priest must make it clear that the sanctuary is a place to talk about God, not our enemies. The narrative in God's house must be a narrative of love, even when the subject is our enemies. Christians gathered in God's house should not be hijacked and treated to a rhetoric about political ambitions. The priest must protect the congregation by refusing, insisting on the worshiper identity. He must insist she must insist on their worshiper identity of the gathering. To start their voter identity is to convert the gathering into a political party branch. And it is not disrespectful to cut short a politician who, given a chance to speak, begins to speak words of hate. A priest should not sit there when a visiting politician spews a rhetoric of hate. If the priest does not teach the politician on God consciousness in the sanctuary, who will? If the priest does not arouse in the politician the sense of the sacred, who will? The church is losing one grand chance to renew itself. Where the world is headed, a domesticated church will not survive. And forces of the new world order do not mind at all a tamed church. They will even supply the life support equipment as long as a persistent coma state is guaranteed. But where the, institu the institution gags itself for a price, Individual Christians should maintain their identity as light of the world and shine fearlessly. 
Jesus first transformed individuals who in turn formed institutions that changed the world. Where the present faith institutions fail, the faith of individuals remains valid to create new institutions that continue the mission that Jesus died and rose for. To love a prodigal world by showing humanity the way back home, home to God, even when this loving means an uncomfortable message. This has been Spotlight. Thanks for watching.